Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with John Kalecki, a uh, friend of the show, uh, legislator, activist, performer, writer, par excellence. Welcome, John. Oh, how nice to be with you again. Thank you very much, my friend. We're here to celebrate the publication of Because Art, this wonderful book that you can you have seen on the screen already, I think. Let me start with a quick description of it for those few of you who don't know about it. And I encourage everybody to go out and get it and read it. I loved it. It's very provocative and mind expanding and interesting. It's my view. Cultural, social, and political commentary on leadership, disability, equines, Buddhism, AIDS, art producing, philanthropy, and legislating. These are some of the topics. Critical analysis of such artists as Ron Athey, John Cage, Douglas Crimp, Keith Haring, Peter Hujar, Donna Ann McAdams, Kevin McKenzie, Heiko Otaki, and Sarah Schulman. Interviews with such art luminaries as Allison Bechtel, Trisha Brown, Janice Ian, Bill T. Jones, Tony Kushner, and Meredith Monk. That's just a glimpse of this rich collection that you're really not going to want to put down. But I some of the essays are short. And so I encourage you to put it down between intervals. Of course, readers can do whatever they want. But um, mm. there might be an impulse to rush through it because it goes so quickly. The pace is really fast. The other option might be to read it several times, which I have availed myself of. Uh, in any case, let's start a little with a little conversation of your biography, John, which is very illustrious and action packed. Um, if I may quote you from a recent interview, in the 70s, I was a dancer. And as a dancer, you learn sometimes you're a soloist, sometimes you're part of the core, and a group improvisation is always stronger. And so input is really important. I think that, uh, and resiliency and flexibility are really central to an artist's process. And then you continue to uh, explain that your background as a dancer has um, made you a better legislator. But let's go back to the 1970s during your period as a dancer. And let's look at a picture now of this gentleman in stripes. Um, in 1973, you moved to New York and began your life as a dancer. You grew up in Chicago, right? Uh, I grew up in Chicago and I was invited uh, to, to study with the Harkins Ballet for the summer in hopes that they would take me into the company. And I was, so at 20 years old, I got a one-way ticket to New York City and there I was. And, you know, I was an excellent dancer in Chicago and I got to New York and it was like, I'm not an excellent ballet dancer on the world stage. I'm, I'm a good dancer, but I wasn't excellent. But if you think about 1973, it was an extraordinary time in the art world. First Stonewall had happened. 79, you know, it, so, so many political things have happened. Um, and so, 69. There, 69, yes, 69. So, so many things had happened and everything was exploding. All the notions of what classical work is and the whole postmodern movement happened in with the Meredith Monks and the Bill T. Joneses and all these people were just making new nascent work. Patti Smith, uh, one night at St. Mark's Church, um, it was uh, New Year's Eve and it was a, everyone had five minutes to help with the poetry project. And up comes this tiny little 
naif of a person and sits down at the piano and she <laughs> sings Gloria and just blows my mind. It was like, that was Patti Smith in her beginnings. And so I found myself um, encountering these artists, working with these artists, having an incredible time, questioning all my um, concepts of what a dancer would be, what a performer is. I also was cast in a play called Coming Out, 1973. I think it actually was the first gay history play. And it was extraordinary for me. We were at Washington Square Park that year for the gay pride parade. It ended in Washington Square Park. And because Coming Out was performing, we were introduced and it was just really thrilling to be on the stage. And up next was Bette Midler. She came out and sang Friends. And for this kid in Chicago to be in New York and watch the world open up in such a way and allow the queer world or the gay world, as it was called back then, to open up, that I found community in a very different way. So I performed, I toured in Canada, I, I danced with Winnipeg Contemporary Dancer, I came back to New York, I performed with Gene Erdman's company, I tried my own work, uh, it was tortured. Um, it was clear that, you know, I, I wasn't gonna be a gifted choreographer or a movement maker, but I loved dance. And so I got to work uh, in an administrative way with Laura Dean and then Trisha Brown was an extraordinary time. It was, uh, we're now in the eighties and- let's, let's pause. Okay. 1979, when you go to the Himalayas, well, uh, also at that time in the sort of postmodern world, many people became interested in Buddhism and the Philip Glasses, the Patti Smiths, the Meredith Monks. So these were people that I was around. These were people who were interested in this journey. And certainly John Cage had been very influential to think about what were these concepts of the Eastern thought and how they could kind of impact the way art practice was happening. And so I also became interested. I sat with a Zen teacher, um, but what was for me, and, and this is in the book, he said, I, he said, I'm too old. I can't take another student on, but you come and sit. And it was profound because I would go every weekend and sit and um, want him to be my teacher. I want, want a, an authority figure. And that wasn't it. It was a perfect Zen experience. So I went to the Tibetans uh, to get more teachings and it was much more interactive. And then suddenly I was like, well, I'm not gonna dance anymore. I got my degree at Hunter College in psychology and early childhood education. But I decided that I'd go up to the Himalayan mountains um, to a monastery because there were 40 kids who were being schooled uh, as young monks and nuns. In, but I realized if I could help them learn English, because at the time I was working in Chinatown in New York in an after school center where the kids could only speak Mandarin and Cantonese. And it was amazing to watch because within six weeks, these kids on the playground could be arguing or playing in English, even though their parents couldn't speak any English. So, you know, I, I saw how it could work. Um, I do not speak Cantonese or Mandarin, but uh, it, I could see how we could, we could teach people English. And so I heard that they were looking for someone to come. So I went, I said, I, I, I'd like to do this. And so I went off to a Tibetan Buddhist monastery in Rumtek Sakin. Uh, and I, when I got there, it, they were thrilled, but the visa said I could only stay for three days hmm. because at that time, Sakin was between India and China. And they, everybody was fighting over Sakim. And so today, Sakim doesn't exist. India took it over. So Sakim was wiped off the map. India controls it now. Um, but back then, it was a separate uh, country. But it was very volatile with the political situation. So they really didn't want Americans there. And I don't know if you remember, the queen of Sakim was a woman, Hope Cook, from New York. And she had to leave the country and they unfortunately killed her husband and the child um, because they didn't want a king to be there. Um, so, so, but there I was in this monastery with these kids. Um, and so they said, well, well, we'll ride Calcutta and we'll see how long you can stay. And so I got to stay a month in this monastery and then the letter came and said, no, the American has to leave. 
So I um, decided not to go back uh, to New York. I went to San Francisco and it's, but the time I was there, um, I was there the, the night Harvey Milk was assassinated. Horr horrifying, you know, uh, moment in, in, in our lives. Who arrived, if I recall. Yes. And the same week Jonestown mm -hmm. happened where 900 people were kind of mass suicide, were poisoned to death. Uh, and Jonestown was from San Francisco as well. So I was very scared by the violence. And then, remember the Roshi, the, te the Zen teacher who wouldn't speak to me? Mm -hmm. He was coming back from Japan and I was told he wanted to come visit me. So I was like, so excited about this. And so what happened, um, it, the, the plane arrives. I was gonna meet him that evening at a reception at the Zen Center. And apparently he didn't feel well and he went right to the hospital. And he dropped dead in the hospital. So it was kind of a, a pure Zen experience. Here I was expecting to be finally recognized as a student. Um, and instead I was uh, at the end of the service at, given his ashes and said, you need to complete the, the journey to New York to bring his ashes back. So um, there I was back on a plane in New York and I'm thinking, what am I gonna do in New York? This is crazy. You know, I, I thought I had left New York, um, but I returned and that's when Laura Dean and then Trisha Brown invited me to run their companies. And so I went from being a dancer after my vision quest, I became an administrator. And that, that was a profound experience. And you know, being a dancer helped me because being an administrator, I really didn't know what I was doing. So every day it was like a great rehearsal, you know, and I would figure things out. Um, and, and I was there at a very seminal moment in, in postmodernism in dance with Trisha Brown, because in the early 80s, we're there now, and um, she was working on a piece with uh, sets by Bob Rauschenberg and music by Laurie Anderson. And it was extraordinary to watch this piece come together. And you, you, you felt it, you saw it, and you knew this was gonna be a masterpiece. And indeed it was, and it was extraordinary. And it kind of changed uh, modern dance because it was lush, it was beautiful. Um, so it was such an honor to know these people, to work with them, and to have that experience with them. And you traveled to Europe and Asia with the Trisha Brown Dance Company. Well, I, I, I traveled all over the world. And what was fun about it, of course, after the New York premiere of this piece, it was called Set and Reset. Um, I, this is pre-internet now. So, um, but I put backpack uh, on and I got, uh, put the press kits in the backpack and I got the list from the Merce Cunningham Company of presenters and theaters in Europe that liked his work. So I got myself a URL pass and <laughs> literally it was like Willie Loman going uh, city to city with a backpack uh, filled with press kits. Mm -hmm. And you know something, it worked because people didn't really know Trisha at that time. And years later, Trisha said to me, and I write about this in the book that, you know, Europe gave her her career because European theaters and European governments spend a lot more on culture than Americans do. So she got commissions over there. We were able to earn more money on tour over there. So it was, it was really, uh, and then from Europe, and then the world opened up and it was a great time to be there and a, a memorable. That's important insight I learned from the book that uh, Europe was often much more supportive of yeah. the than the US. Um, so now let's go to the end of 1980s and you arrive at the Walker Art Center as the curator of performing arts. During well, the culture wars. Which well, I, I, your I, I think it's, and, and I think this is one of the reasons I wanted to put this book together. And, uh, you know, it's a compilation of my writings from the last 30 years. But my writing really began um, I mean, I talk about these early years, but it really began in earnest in the early 90s when I was at the Walker, but also 
you and I were living through the AIDS pandemic. Mm -hmm. And by the late 80s in New York, when I was there, something terrible was happening. And we couldn't get our arms around it, but our friends were dying. You know, the, the hospitals were a nightmare for us to go visit our friends because they were often in isolation or they were so full, they just would be in hallways. And our friends were wasting away. And, you know, AIDS, there was, malfeasance is the word I can only use about our government's response to it, pharmaceutical companies' response to it. And what was interesting is that the art world became very politicized at that time. So, you know, I have a piece about Keith Haring in there. I have a piece about, in the book, I have a piece about Peter Hujar, the great photographer in there. I have interviews with Bill T. Jones and I have, Sarah Schulman's um, about her ACT UP book, which just came out and, and, that, and that's in my book. Because what happened was that artists, the artist community in New York was galvanized as I was trying to figure out first how to hold on to our dear ones who, who were dying and then how to deal with this grief and, um, and then how to motivate into action. And so ACT UP, happened in New York and around the country. And, but there was a real artist centeredness in the ACT UP group. And so visual aids happened and Grand Fury, the collective happened. And many artists start making work in response to AIDS. And so of course, in 1988, I went to the Walker Art Center, which was a contemporary art center in Minneapolis. My job was to present performing artists. So what I did was present the emerging new names and they were powerful, they were cathartic, they were angry. And it was people like Karen Finley, it was uh, Bill T. Jones, it was Ron Athey, and it was uh, Holly Hughes, it was Tim Miller. All these people are in this book, uh, sort of reviews of their work, my, my experience of working with them. And what happened was that suddenly these artists who had been working on the fringes were brought into the mainstream like a Walker Art Center and it ignited what we call the culture wars. And, you know, it was Senator Jesse Helms was screaming in Congress that, you know, Ron Athey is a cockroach and how can, how can public dollars support this work? And it's like, well, gosh, everybody's a taxpayer. So yeah. why, sh why should it be your taste? Um, and they were very organized. Yeah, again, this is pre-internet, so it was mailing list. The Donald Wildman American Family Association gave out my home address and phone number. And I was getting all these letters saying I was going to go to hell and that, you know, I, it, it was a, a very frightening time because there was such a movement to, to really silence these artists and to deny them grants. And what happened is corporations moved away from supporting individual artists, states moved away, the National Art for the Arts stopped pretty much their uh, fellowships for individual artists. So America turned its back on its individual artists uh, as a, in response to the culture war. So, you know, the arts community lost. We lost a great deal. And at the same time, we were losing a generation of artists okay. dying from AIDS. In your interview with Tim Miller, I think he says, you know, I was under siege by the government, but the fight against AIDS was much more important to me. Yes. And let's go to a reading you would, uh, thought you might do that touches on uh, that period. What I, what I did is, uh, as my friends began to die, I started writing pieces, um, and they were elegies to them. They were me trying to heal myself as well. And so I, these became films I've made and I've made three AIDS related films and, uh, in the nineties. And I've been very blessed. They've been shown around the world and their museum and library collections. Um, so this is a piece that I wrote in um, 1995 and it's, it's a three part piece, but this is one part and it's called Stolen Shadows.
I was in New York and went to a movie. Afterwards, I walked from the theater on the Upper East Side to Greenwich Village, where I was staying. It was Sunday morning and the streets were empty. I passed 62nd and 2nd, where I used to live with Bill. Not too long ago, I had been listening to his concerns about his plummeting T-cell counts. Further down on Lexington Avenue, I passed the apartment where Gary and his lover lived. Gary left that apartment and moved to Florida after his partner died. Just across the street was Christopher's apartment where Stephanie was now staying. I can still recall reminiscing with her, listening to how much she missed him. Crossing over to the west side, I ambled into Chelsea. About a mile north was Manhattan Plaza. Kevin moved there after Don died. I wonder who lives there now, now that Kevin is gone. On 24th and 9th, I passed Vito's apartment, where I often stopped on my way home for the latest gossip from the Hollywood closet. How angry he'd be if he were still alive and how little has changed. A few blocks further downtown, and I was in the village. Here, on every block, I looked up and saw shadows of those taken from me far too soon. Images of my lost ones surrounded me, overwhelmed, stunned, and numb with grief. I tried hard to hold on to some of my stolen shadows. And this is an uh, excerpt from a video, and I think you have a picture yes. uh, that we can show as you do the reading. Um, it was a terrible time, and I think all of us are irrevocably affected by it. I remember Paul Monette's wonderful Love Alone, and I was teaching it in New Orleans at the time, and I thought, am I going to cry in class? I mean, it's that kind of subject. Um, well, you, you know, when that film was shown in Los Angeles at Outfest, I got a note from Paul Monette's lover, Paul had died. Mm -hmm. um, and he thanked me because he said he felt the film represented their relationship as well. So I was very touched by that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Here's, this, here's what's important to me about this is that when I show these films or when I lecture at colleges about different, the culture wars or other aspects of things in my life. This generation of uh, queer folk have really no idea of what happened uh, right post Stonewall in New York or when ACT UP happened and certainly have really lost the I, reality of what AIDS was like at that time in our lives. And so to me, I hope that this book and uh, telling my story and also you know, as you read, I feel that by profiling these other artists, one, one third of the book is really profiles of artists that I'm telling, I'm writing about them, but I get to tell my story uh, in writing about them. And that's, so it's th three parts in the book. One of these essays I've written, and some of them are formal. One was a commencement dress at the Art Institute. Others are excerpts from my videos. The second section of the book are these critiques of artists, you know, but they're the artists I mentioned, Peter Hujar, Keith Haring, Bilty Jones, um, people that, you know, I knew I, I thought was important. And as you'll see, as you read some of the names, it's a lot of queer artists in here. So there's a queer uh, through line. There's also a disability through line. There's a lot of artists with disabilities. There's Kenny Freeze, Judy Smith, Terry Galloway, Eli Clare, Vermont's own Eli Clare's in there too. And then the third section of the book is interviews with artists that I've done over the years. And you mentioned uh, a number of them. Um, and, you know, it, Tony Kushner's interview in the book could be about today, about Israel and Palestine and what's going on and about how artists need to be political. You know, it was, it was done, I think, in 2004 or something. 
you know, it's great to hear Janice Ian talk about what it means to be an artist mm -hmm. and what's the role of an artist in society. Tim Miller does the same thing. He talks about artists are the first responders. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he talked certainly about AIDS, but he talked about the Me Too movement um, and certainly now with Black Lives Matter. So he, um, I, that seems relevant to me. And, you know, you, the last piece is a, a wonderful, two choreographers in the Bay Area, Brenda Way and Alonzo King, and it's called Choreographing Community. And what I liked about that piece, it's about, they are choreographers who also have schools and they made it possible for others, other artists to be presented at their schools and be trained at their schools. And part of what I tried to do as an administrator or when I was running the Flynn, for instance, um, was to make sure it was for the community, that communities were invited in. And I think the same thing happens now that I, in my second term in the legislature is this interest I had and in the avant-garde and the marginalized artists and my experiences with that world really informs how I do my work now. So I am working on homelessness issues, I'm working on homelessness bill of rights, but it really just comes out of my AIDS activism or my disability activism. You know, I, I'm working on compensation issues and you know, the exemptions to the minimum wage that FDR put in place were all race-based, you know, to, to exempt domestic workers, to exempt farm workers. So we're trying to address some of this stuff now. And so to me, that's part of the whole of this. That, that, and that's, you know, I, as, you, as I put this together, first I put it chronologically and then it didn't make sense because it didn't tell the story I wanted. I wanted it to be this mosaic, of my life, artists that have impacted my life, and how in the end, it's all about transformational change, that each person can make a difference. And so my hope in this book is that you and I can relate to this book because we live through it. The next two generations, I'm not sure these histories have been written. And so to me, it was important especially some of these artists like Ariza Abdo, who was so incredible. He's been forgotten because he's not been written about. So in trying to write about these people, I want to put a mark in the world that Reza Abdo lived and he was important. He was the Arto of our day. Mm -hmm. And AIDS took him. Well, the second time I met you when you came on the show in your conversation with Keith, you mentioned AIDS and I thanked you afterwards because it is a danger. One of our local gay theater companies put on a play called Borrowed Time. And I raised my hand in the talk deck and said, haven't you heard of Paul Manette's memoir? And there were some older gay men in the audience nodding vigorously, but they hadn't. So the, you know, the question of um, amnesia is really pressing in this regard. And that history can't be lost. It's too important. Well, and uh, you know, we have a, a great organization supporting queer youth in our state. And what's been amazing is pre-COVID, 91 kids came to the state house to meet without legislators. And that's pretty amazing. In my life, that would have seemed inconceivable. I mean, there I was in San Francisco when Harvey Milk was assassinated for being openly gay. And there weren't many role models at that point. So we have role models now that we didn't have before. But I think it's important for people to understand the, the two generations ago, what it, was, what it was like for us. And I hope that some of the next generation will read some of this and see, okay, you can, now aspire to be Becca Ballant, our president pro temp. But that was a radical notion and it was an impossible notion even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago when I was growing up, it didn't exist. So it's, it's an interesting time and, and that's why I wanted to go back and talk about some of this stuff. And it's stuff that, you know, everything in the book has been published somewhere. Uh, and so I, thought it was interesting to go back. Then 
as I was looking at it, everything had been published with different editors with different editorial styles. So I then had to go back and copy edit it for consistency because I wanted it not to tell a story. So you will see in the very back of the book when it says about the text, it will say these pieces have been slightly edited. Um, and I thought that was important to do. I didn't change the stories, but I, I sort of um, fixed some gr grammatical mistakes in some of my early writing um, and copy editors helped me make it consistent throughout. Because that's a danger in essay collections, you know, repetition and chronological confusion and so forth. And I love that you dated each piece so we can place it, but you do create a very effectively, I think the idea of a mosaic. And um, it's really, it's really provocative and, you know, it opens your mind, it opens my mind. Um, and I would like to ask you, well, let me just, let's turn to your role as a legislator. And we have a picture before you now, before us now of you in that position. And I'd like to quote you to yourself, if I may, from, um, your arts advocacy through a politician's lens piece. Living in a rural state, I witnessed the devastating realities of income inequality, people living through generational destitution, addiction, and trauma need the arts to help with healing. More money is not needed to diversify audiences for major institutions. Investments need to be made to enable all community members to be enriched by art and culture in order to live more resilient lives. That's such a wonderful sentiment and you try to enact it in the legislature. Well, I do it, but I want to go back to, you know, when I was 20, went to New York and got cast in coming out, uh, people would say to me, that, arts community, well, is it art or is it politics? And I was like, well, why can't it be both? And I think from that early age, I could see art could be a really change agent, that it was, that it should be a change agent. And really, if you look through history, Guernica oh. is a, a profound painting about war. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a statement. And so you can really, sometimes we, we take the history out of this, but it, it's, art should be a change agent and so I just feel now that I'm working in the legislature and what's missing is an integration of arts in people's lives because it can help people it's helped me it's helped my friends it's it's built community in a different way and so it can help heal people as well and so I really feel it's essential that it, arts need to be integrated in community um let me quote you again this is timely uh, passage about our current moment, imagining a post-pandemic art world. We are in this liminal moment, imagining a post-pandemic art world. The opportunity in this crisis will be lost if in hindsight, we simply rush to put everything back together the way it was. That's another profound insight. There are many of them throughout this volume. Well, thank you, Ed. thank you, and, and you know, I think given that I've lived through these generations of, of things, that it, I felt it was important to say it that in the '60s art was reinvented, you know, and I lived through it in the '70s. But you know, Peter Brook told us that all we needed was an empty stage, and that we 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 need to begin again, and so that was part of that. Another piece in there is I was able to draw from. Uh, my lived experience during the AIDS pandemic in an essay I wrote about when early COVID was happening and talking about the lessons we learned uh, from AIDS and I hope we can bring that compassion and that caring for each other forward in the COVID experience. And I think Vermonters have embraced each other and taken care of each other in a very profound way. Other states, not so much. Uh, and nationally. It's yeah romantic in many senses. You know, I, if I may, I, uh, uh, another thing that was in the beginning of the book, but it is a through line in the book is around disability. Um, because 20, 
yeah, 25 years ago, I was uh, paralyzed from the neck, neck down. I had a tumor inside my spinal cord. And so there was spinal surgery. And I unexpectedly, uh, I woke up quadriplegic. And the surgery kind of went haywire. And so I found myself in a rehab hospital and for six weeks. And then I was sent home in a wheelchair. But what was interesting to me is that when they would pick me out of the bed and move me to a wheelchair to move me into kind of rehab therapy that they were doing, it seemed I don't have any sensation in my legs, even now, 25 years later, but it seemed that somehow my body could figure out how to stand up. So one day I said to them, and I write about this in, in the book, bring a mirror over. I think I can learn to stand up visually. And they're like, what? And I said, no, no, as a dancer, we rehearse with mirrors. We learn to like work with the mirrors. And so I said, just bring it over. What, what does it matter? So they brought it over and they get the walker. I had crutches, uh, braces on both legs. I'd stand there and I was able to use my visual sense to figure out how to stand up and that, okay, now this is what it means to be straight, standing straight. And then after that, I, they had the parallel bars and I, I would kind of move and, and begin to move my legs. And so I'm so lucky that I'd been a dancer because I don't think that I would be able to walk and stand up. Now, I, I walk with a cane. I've walked with a cane for 25 years. But this dancer in me was able to figure out a different way of moving that my body couldn't do it. In. And so, the, you know, I'm lucky the occupational therapists were like, well, this is great. Let's try it, you know. And, um, but the, that dancer has remained in my life. Very important. And of course, you wake up quadriplegic and you become politicized immediately right you you suddenly you see how the world treats people with disabilities in a very profound way and how inaccessible the world is and um i out of my experience i i actually wrote a book that with uh, bob guter we it was a collection it was called queer crips disabled gay men and their stories and as we were putting this idea together it was a lot of uh, and and th there was already a women's and disability um, book that had come out. So I wanted to focus on just gay men at the time. Um, and it was really important to me because I had to find community. You know, we're talking about community. There wasn't a community that I knew about. So, you know, and so I went and, um, you know, it, the, the book took three years to put together. All the queer presses didn't like it because it's like, nah, no, you got to have buff boys and lipstick dykes in it. It won't work. It won't sell. And, and all the disability presses turned it down because um, there's a term inspiration porn that you want all people with disabilities to be inspirational. <laughs> Aren't they magical? You know, <laughs> look at that. Isn't that special? You know, and it happens that this inspiration porn, but it's like, that's not the realities. It's about depression no it's about when you get horny what do you do when you're disabled you know if you're deaf you can't really go into a gay bar if it's if it's dark light because you won't be able to read people's lips imagine rolling in a wheelchair into a gay bar and being seen you know and so th there's one piece in the book of um, someone hiring a hustler you know and uh, but it's about the realities of depression it's about the realities of just surviving and Eli Clare's in it, um, you know, uh, Kenny Freeze is in it, Raymond Lusick is in it, a um, uh, number of people. And what was great for me uh, and very validating is that it, it won a Lambda Literary Award. I know, it, 2003 or 2004? Uh, it's published in 2003. I think it won it in 2004. That's for, great kudos. For best anthology, for, for something that no one said would have a place in the world. But, you know, queer studies and disability studies still use the book. Um, I think I got, um, 
a three dollar royalty check <laughs> this week so it's someone's still buying it in the world which is is great but it was a way for me first to build community and then share community into the wider world so that's my um one of my questions what's your community now would you say is it I mean, we're unified beings, and you're cert you've certainly embraced a lot of communities during your time, and are operating and making new communities now with this book and so forth. But how would you describe your community? I was trying to think about it with myself, and there are a whole lot of different communities. I don't know that I have. There's a unitary, maybe the art world. Well, no, no, I think it's a, a wonderful question, but. You know, it's it's uh, it, the reason I put the book together as a mosaic is I feel our communities are mosaic like because I grew up Irish Catholic. My father sold cattle at the Chicago Stockyards, so it was working poor Irish Catholic. Um, I have four other siblings, so I have that community. Um, I have, you know, my dance community. I have my queer communities. I have my disabled communities, and they're all plural. I have my legislative communities. I have my art world communities. Um, and I feel like uh, all of these lived experiences that I have, or you have, I mean, you're part of my community, you know, um, just, I, I bring them all along. And I also bring along all those that have gone before me, all those that I've lost. And so that's, really a part of this is I wanted to make sure that I call out the Lees, the Kevins, you know, the Christophers, the people that I know that have died, because they are my community as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me um, quote you again to yourself. This is about uh, your writing in VT Digger about Uiko Otaki's book body in fukushima and you and she did a wonderful performance piece that we mentioned when we talked to donna mcadams but at the end you say about her book but it also applies to yours art performs life in this evocative book reminding us that the role artists play in commemorating losses can never be underestimated Art is indeed where hope lives. And I think this book is testimony to that. Mm. Is there going to be a sequel? Uh, well, no. I think that I, uh, I, I, I called my archives of my writing. Uh, I've been very blessed. I've published, I think, over 300 pieces. And I felt this was a great selection from that, so there won't be that. Um, I don't think so. You know, I, 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 as you know, I make films and I do other kinds of thing. I felt that this was my artist project right now. And it all started actually when my, my youngest brother, Bill, told me that my dad had given him a cassette tape. And I had never heard this cassette tape. And I said, what, what was in this cassette tape? And he said, well, dad gave it to him and said, just in case anyone wants to, learn about my life. And so I, I thought that was a beautiful impetus for me to kind of put together something. And it's like, oh, it's just perhaps if someone wants to learn about my life, but it's my lived experience versus my life. This is about my communities. This is about the eras that I, you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, you know, postmodernism, AIDS activism, culture wars, you know, going off to the Himalayan mountains. Uh, so many of us back then did vision quests. And some people moved to Vermont to be in communes at the time. I went off to the Himalayan mountains, you know. Um, and then, you know, uh, disability is, is a, a key part. And I am, it's very important to me that in, as a legislator that I make sure those voices are heard as well. And all these disparate voices that I try to bring forward with me. No memoir then. No, 
picture. Not to meet you, he made me. I mean, it's been an incredibly interesting life. And you're right, it's not narcissistic the way uh, some memoirs have been accused of being, although it's kind of a narcissistic memoir is kind of oxymoronic. But, you know, you're always reaching outward and um, creating community with the book, as I said. And how did you have to decide to put it together? Was it your father's cassette tapes? Yes, I thought, well, this, what, what would my cassette tape be in the world? So I thank my brother, Bill, for that. Before we leave, I'd like to ask you to read from one of my favorite sections of the book involving Raindrop. Well, okay, let me set it up first, if I, if I may. Uh, I, I mentioned my father sold cattle to Chicago South Carrots. And what he had to do every weekend is go to farms and talk to farmers and convince them to give him their cattle to sell because that's how he made his living. And my father and I had a very contentious relationship, but I loved going on weekends with him. I, my other siblings hated it. They didn't like the, the poop and everything else about it, but I loved it. I, and one day I, we were in Milledgeville, Illinois, and it was pouring rain. And we went to this farm that had cattle that my father knew. They also had Shetland ponies. And I was mesmerized because I watched a pony being born in the pouring rain. And her name was Raindrop from the rain. And so that Raindrop, I was eight years old, I think, became my best friend. And every time my father would go to that part of Illinois, I would go with him and he just would leave me off in the morning. And I would just play with the, the pony in the field, run with her, I loved her. And the farmers would ring the bell when it was lunchtime and I would come in if I was cold or something. But most of the time I just stayed out in the field with the pony, I loved this animal. And so, you know, this went on for years and the, Mrs. Handel died and they didn't have us. And I'd be, you know, in high school, I got busy. So I didn't visit Raindrop as, as much, but fast forward, you know, I, we talked about me becoming uh, paraplegic where I have not really use for my legs. So I, I, you can't ride a horse with, if you, in, with no strength in your legs. But I did one day say to my husband, Larry, let's go find Shetland ponies. He's like, what? I said, no, as a kid, I loved ponies and I just want to visit them. So we were living in San Francisco. So we Googled it and we found this great, a farm in Moss Landing by Santa Cruz. And we visited them and they mostly had fields where they were growing strawberries and things, but they had a herd of about nine or 10 Shetland ponies. And they said, you know, next, next weekend, we're showing them at the Santa Cruz County Fair, so come. Um, and so we went down to the fair and they were driving ponies in carts. It, it's not races, it's like it was, the dressage kind of things where they were showing them. And I looked and I said to Larry, I think I can do that. And so from that moment, I got a trainer. I went down to that farm and they taught me how to hitch up a pony in a cart and drive it. Because when you're seated in a cart, you don't use your legs. You just control the animal this way with the reins and stuff. So um, I became, let's say, obsessed um, with, with Shetlands once again in my life. And when we moved to Vermont, um, the farm that we were at, Moss Landing, um, they, it was pour, they knew about my raindrop as a child. And one May, uh, it was pouring rain and their mayor, Mamzelle, had a new baby. And it was the exact same coloring is my childhood raindrop. So they named the pony raindrop. So uh, that was in 2007. In 2010, I moved to Vermont to run the Flynn Center. And as a going away gift, they gave me raindrop. So I, I trucked her out to Vermont and she now, I, learned how to hitch her up and we drive around in a cart at the barn. And so I'll, I'll read a piece about that, if I, if I may. And as you read, we'll show you, we'll show the audience a picture. 
No, perfect. <laughs> Being a novice at midlife is both gratifying and humbling. Acquiring new skills is rejuvenating. Laughter rather than embarrassment at failure and learning from mistakes propel improvement. My competitive self is satisfied with a training session well done. Thrilled that Raindrop and I have done our best for that day. In working with my pony, I must first understand the world through her eyes, her smells, her experiences, her fears, and her relationships. Equine logic is quite different from human thinking. I try to see the world as she does. Human vision is focused straight ahead. Horses see at 350 degrees, encompassing peripheral vision. Imagine the world opening up in startling ways. Space and light are transformed. No place is more important than another. The images behind are equal to that in front. As I drive her in the ring, I must embrace the entire arena and look beyond the animal before me and perceive the environment as she does. At the barn, the virtues of simplicity are revealed through the quotidian of mundane chores. My executive director self has no gravitas here. Status is irrelevant. It's hard to be grand mucking out stalls or pounding through ice and frozen buckets. The teenagers know more than I do, and I often seek their advice, as well as that of an old friend in her 80s who rides her 29-year-old gelding every day. Given my physical limitations, I'm dependent on stablemates to get me safely in and out of the cart. So that's from that section. And when I'm in that cart, I'm not disabled. I'm dancing again, going around in circles, making figure eights. I'm running again. And I have to say that a raindrop is my spirit animal. And I'm so grateful to go to a happy place every day that has nothing to do with that I'm a legislator or had nothing to do with that I ran the Flynn. It's that I have to be fully present with that animal and really understand the world through her. I can't impose my will on this animal. I, it has to be a totally shared experience. And I, as dancing, I think this informs everything I do every day. Uh, any last comments? Any last? Well, I, you know, I th thank you for having me on your show again. I I love your show, and I just want to say that I, you know, the book launch is actually the public launch is going to be happening on September twenty third at the Pride Center. Um, we're going to do. Uh, Justin is going to interview me about the book, and uh, half the uh, the books for sale there, and half the proceeds are going to be for the Pride Center, which I'm thrilled to support, of course. Um, I think is very important. And, and then the next week on September 27th, I'm going to be at the South Burlington Public Library. And I asked Mark Redman, who's the head of Spectrum, which is for homeless youth in Burlington. He also has a new book out. And I said, why don't we do this together and talk about leading these hybrid lives, about writing. Um, and his book is called Called. And it's about his service for his entire career for homeless youth and, and supporting the youth to find a, a safe place for people. And the first chapter of my book uh, is called Call to Serve, and it's about my vocation in supporting artists and marginalized voices. So I thought there was an incredible synergy, even though about different communities, but I said, Let, let's do this together. So anyway, that's September 27th at 5.30 at South Burlington Library. Collaborating in every aspect of your life, John, is very commendable. And I really appreciate your joining us. And I encourage everyone to read this wonderful, elegant, smart book um, and to go to the readings that John mentioned. I'm certainly going to do that. Well, John thank you. Kalecki, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I love you and I love your buddies at All Things LGBTQ. And I so appreciate what you've done for our community. Thank well, you, thank you, thank you. Uh -huh. I know we're signing off, but I, you know, you mentioned that you joined 
the legislature, you embarked on that career as a way to get back. And I was thinking of this show, we're both, we're all retired and it's our way of trying to give back, you know? So we're all in it together. Well, and what I appreciate also is your historical threads and your contemporary stuff as well. You, in, you are interviewing people who are making change in our communities right now, but you're now drawing back on the histories. So you, you really are allowing a full embodied voice of, of queer history to be seen. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. It's really important. Well, thank you, John. And thank you, you'll have to come on again to tell us about more of your projects. I would love to do that. And I appreciate your support. And thank you for everything you've said about my book, Because Art, it means a great deal to me. Well, it's all true. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, resist. resist.